But anyway, it's good stuff. Bob has quite a, quite a history, so I'm happy to introduce him in a formal way. Um, as some of you probably know, he's a co-author of the, Innovator, in, the Innovator's Way, Essential Practices with Successful Innovation with Dr. Peter Denning. He's also developed a one-year management and action program with Dr. Fernando Flores, holds two Stanford degrees, was on the staff that developed the three-year ontological design course, and has led the onboarding software development team for the Hubble Space Telescope for several years. He holds two patents for workflow technology based on the structure of human coordination. And he is founded in his active in enterprise performance, which is a performance consulting company that had lots of um, highfalutin clients. And um, he's a great guy. I'll just say just how I met Bob. Um, I um, was taking something called the Intersur Journey. And I have to say, Bob was probably the most buttoned down of the people that was in this particular gathering. Um, and what he had to say blew me away, you know? So um, I had to reach out to him and invite him to do one of our monthly gatherings. And uh, Bob, um, it's all yours and uh, welcome. Welcome everybody. Great. Great, thank you. First of all, I wanna <clears throat> thank Angelo for inviting me uh, to this conversation and thank the Sacred Inclusion Network for the work they're doing in the world. Um, and thank you for uh, also uh, showing up and being in this conversation. So let's begin with a wave. I wanna make sure that we're, we're alive, we're breathing, we got real people here, not cutouts. Yeah, <laughs> good. And uh, if your cameras are off, unless it's uh, uh, not possible, I'll ask you to turn them on. I would like this to be a connected conversation, not a presentation that's uh, being looked at. Uh, and if your <clears throat> microphones are, or on, go ahead and mute them and you can turn them off when you're going to speak. That's the logistics of it. So I'm, uh, I appreciate this invitation because in the work I do, I've been working with <clears throat> the question, what is action? And how do people create in the world for 40 years? And I almost never use the word spirit because, uh, when people show up at the beginning, I, I, I wanna make sure that they're getting the full action in the world story. Uh, I do use the word soul on occasion because there's something in the background of our lives and the background of our actions uh, in the way we relate to life and the world that we have to go deep to find where some of the, the, the waves of meaning come from. And <clears throat> this is a, a powerful part of the, of the inner journey where it's not about learning skills and techniques and having choices. It's more about <clears throat> developing the relationship with what is beyond you. And in my view, having done a lot of reflection around spirit over the years, um, that's the domain of spirit. What is beyond you? What is outside your understanding? What is outside <clears throat> your everyday sensibility? And for some, <clears throat> that dimension doesn't exist. If, if, if I can't understand it, if I can't chew it, if, if I can't punch it, it doesn't exist. And for other people, there's a, an openness and a sensitivity that there is something there. And there's not only something there, but we can't understand it and interact with it in our normal way. But if we open big enough to hold reality, to hold our reality, to hold our world as including that which we don't know, to, to including that which is mystery, then we have a chance to have a relationship with what I think people call spirit. And so, spirit well, was, uh, somebody has their microphone on, turn it off please. I'm, I'm sure it's a very interesting. If, uh, and, and if the host could, Take care of that. Thank you. 
ah, logistics, ah, virtual logistics. And, uh, and here we are. And so the, the threads I want to follow with you, I'm, I'm, I'm offering myself as a guide in a conversation. I don't, I'm not here to offer answers or truths. I'm, I'm here to offer perspectives to explore because I believe if we take the question, what is spirit, for example, the answer is unique to each of us. We each have our own relationship to spirit. Just as we each have our relationship to action, to the world, or to anything else that stands out in our lives. Each of us has a relationship to love and courage and pain and suffering. Culturally, that there's been enough people who have entered these domains of experience and shared what they saw, and there, there tends to be some social agreement about what this stuff is. And then, then we get confused when we enter and saying, oh, it's this, <laughs> but it doesn't match my experience. And what I wanna do is have us take a journey here into our experience. So for me, for about 55 years, I had this question, what is spirit? <laughs> and I didn't have an answer. I mean, I had lots of answers. I had books and people talking and all of this going on. But spirit was not part of my life as an experience. It seemed to be some abstraction, some concept that other people knew about, but it wasn't in my life. And so I had this question, is it real? Is what these other people are talking about really there? Is it, is it available to me? What, what is spirit? I think this shows that there's a path of exploration on this journey. And spirit did show up for me in my experience. And it showed up in a particular moment when I was in despair, when I was working with my, my enterprise, I was trying to uh, be faithful to a mission to take something to the world and it wasn't working so good. <laughs> and so I had spent many years like, well, I ain't working, I just have to work harder. Well, that ain't working, then I just have to work harder. And it was about me, 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 and I got to do it. And I finally got to the point and said, I can't do this. And I actually took a moment and I said, what am I going to do with this, with this despair, with this defeat, with this emptiness in having a purpose, having a meaning and feeling a failure. And I literally had a conversation with the universe or spirit, if you want to use that word. And, and I had this conversation and it was very real for me. And I said, I can't do this. I think it's worth doing, but <laughs> I'm not up to it. <laughs> I need help. So I'd like to make a deal with you. I'll continue to do what I can in the best way I know how. But how this works out is up to you. I'm not going to suffer about it anymore. It's not going to be a measure of my ego achie achievement. It's up to you. And there was not only relief, but in making that deep heartfelt invitation and request for what was beyond me, for what, what I could not name or, or, or know how to deal with, things began to change around me. Literally mir miracles began to show up that shifted my life. And that's when I saw oh, this spirit stuff is real. That's my experience. Do I sit down and have a chat with spirit and it talks back to me? No, because I find my relationship with spirit, I have to listen deeply. I have to get out of my own chatter. And I think that's part of the wisdom traditions. 
of spirit that when we learn about me meditation, for example, what is meditation? Meditation is letting go. It's getting rid of all the triggers and the reactions and the content and the ha 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 of our lives to, to be open in to listen deeply for something that can show up that's not just the chatter of our mind or the reactions of our body and emotions. And so that's my spiritual journey and I'm here to, to offer some perspectives, not answers, but perspectives, some questions for you. What I can also share is that I have been in the question, what is action for over 40 years? And in that exploration of what is action, <clears throat> have developed a, a discipline called generative leadership and joined with colleagues. We now have the Institute for Generative Leadership active in the US, Latin America, Asia, UK, and uh, a growing community. But something that I learned in that, and, and that we learned, those of who have entered the, that path of learning, is that leadership is not a domain of concepts that you apply. It's, it's, it's a domain of experiences, awarenesses, and actions that create experiences. And I believe there, our relationship with spirit can be similar that we don't have to just go to meditation and to the mountaintop and disconnect. <clears throat> my interest, because my starting point was action, is how does spirit live in action? How does spirit live in our lives every day, every moment, rather than we check out to go touch spirit or invite spirit once in a while? So that's my invitation for our exploration here today. And the manner of exploration I found in, in my tradition uh, uh, that the most important question to begin with when you're thinking about something, when you're reflecting, when you're trying to <clears throat> move forward in your life or in action is the question, what? And this is important because when I first heard this, 30 something years ago, I saw that in myself and the people that were in the learning path that I was experiencing at the time, that our cultural common sense is how? Well, how do I do spirit? How do I do leadership? Tell me how. <laughs> and the problem is if you don't know what you're dealing with, your answer to how is going to be missing what's most important. So our most important question for this kind of exploration is what? What is something? And I began with the question, what is action? That was a question posed to me by Dr. Fernando Flores, my first master teacher in my learning journey. I said, what is action? It showed up in a workshop and they asked this question and, and uh, my first reaction was, oh shit, I didn't read that chapter last night. I'm not going to pass this quiz. And, uh, and then I stopped and said, no, I'm a, I'm a, I had two degrees from, from a big university. I had led organizations. I, 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 I said, I could, I could make a pretty good an answer to what is action. <laughs> I think I could slide by here. And that was my first encounter with blindness. I actually was shocked to say, here I am living in a culture. I was a, a vice president in a, in a Silicon Valley company. And I saw I really didn't know what action was. Other than the story I could make up. And I, and I suddenly realized that everybody else in the room who had heard that question was probably in a similar reaction. What is action? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> oh, 
we'll go to the everyday, you know, it's doing stuff, it's movement. And they proceeded to give me a new perspective. So the first experience was, damn, there's something I don't know. <laughs> the encounter with the unknown. And I think that's a place that we meet spirit, if we have spirit, if, if we know how to meet spirit. And so in that blindness, they offered a new perspective I had never heard before. They said, action is commitment. And I, my head spun, I say, okay, what does that mean? And, and we proceeded to unpack and learn that action is commitment, that we actually take action because we're committed to, if you're not committed to an action, you're probably not taking it. Or you're not taking it with any kind of ownership. And so commitment, this was a new perspective that, oh my God, action. See, action for me was doing stuff in the world, external activity and results, right? And this was a new perspective. And so we began to do some exercises exploring commitments being created in conversation. Will you do this? Yes or no? I promise. I don't promise. And, and we saw how often in action conversations you would go and say, will you do this? Well, I'll try. Oh, that would be good. We'll see how it goes. And so I, I, I was awakened to the presence or absence of commitment in an action conversation. It changed my world. And it had a couple of qualities. One is I began to pay attention in conversation to what's the commitment going on? What's the commitment going on? What's my commitment? What's your commitment? Are we on the same page? I'd never done that before. And it opened up something else. <clears throat> it opened up another blind spot. It revealed to me that the culture I'd grown up in and the way I thought about things, action and results, was all about out there. You take action out there. You produce results out there. And this new perspective showed me something I never saw before, that what you do out there is connected to what's going on in here. That the interior state and experience is what actually shaped your action and result. And all of a sudden the domain of action was also the domain of your interior life. And so I give this as an example of us moving through life and part of being a human being is having blind spots. <laughs> We can't know everything, we don't see everything. In a very practical way, um, I see my blindness when I, when I meet someone who's a professional in, a, in another domain. When I meet a physician, I know they see things about bodies and health that I don't see. I have blindness there that they don't. If I talk to someone who's, who's a chef or a good cook, I know they see things I don't see. When I go to the kitchen, the only thing I know about kitchens is cans and can openers. <laughs> and so this awareness of awareness, this awareness of blindness that, that we're walking around blind was in itself an immense change in my world. That action really arose from an interior state and that people were blind to this and many other things. And that what is action? Action is from this point of view of commitment, the coordination of action is producing a shared commitment. I'm gonna unpack this a little more later. What I want you to get out of this 
introduction is we're walking around in our world thinking we know what it is. And we may not be aware of our blind spots. And so when we try to do something new or accomplish something or learn something, one of the habits we fall into is we try to pack it into what we already know, our, our current frame of understanding, and we may miss the new world that's being offered to us from a new perspective. And this takes some skill, it takes some skill of being open. It takes some skill of letting go and, and re-embracing. And it takes us to another question that's very important for our life journey called, what is learning? What is learning for you? And so there's three questions I want to share with you in, in this exploration together today. I've already opened the what is action conversation. I, I, I want to explore what is spirit and I want to explore what is spirit in action. But I don't want to do it in telling a grand story of Bob's theory. I want it to be an exploration of your experience of these things. And the place we're beginning here is your experience always arises from a perspective. It always arises from how you see things. And so this question is, how are you going to see your world? And our culture doesn't ask that question. So most of us think we see the world. <laughs> <laughs> and we do in a particular way, but we don't see that we don't see many other opportunities for how to see the world. How are we doing? Ready to go forward in our exploration? Cool. Okay. So, let me share, I've got a few images in a, that I want to share with you that'll help us understand some things. If I can do my, okay. So uh, Ian, if you could uh, enable my sharing my screen. Uh, we'll go there. And while we're waiting for that, I've introduced the powerful questions what is something? And I want to say a couple of things about the question and about the answer we're looking for in this exploration. The first thing is the kind of answer that I have learned to look for in the question, what is something, is I want to have an answer that enables me to take action in my relationship with this what. I just don't want to describe something. So I don't want to know what love is. I want to know what loving is. I want it to be available for my choice and action. I just don't know, want to know a definition of what action is. I want to be able to take action. And what interpretation we have either enables that or it doesn't. So we use the word generative, you know, uh, the Institute for Generative Leadership, for example. And, and the word generative means we're looking for an interpretation that enables you to have choice and action. If we have a generative interpretation of love, you can create love. You can experience love, not just explain love. Same with courage. Same with action, same with leadership. In so many places in our lives, we don't have generative interpretation. And so that's what we're looking for. And so when we ask what is spirit, we're gonna be looking for what is a possible generative interpretation. Maybe not to create spirit, although there's a possibility for that in our internal life, but also to be receptive to spirit. What is a generative interpretation? The second thing I want to say about questions and answers in general is our culture has taught us that questions have right answers and wrong answers, and we want the right one. 
and it makes us stupid. Because when you have the right answer, there are very limited number of questions that have just one answer. They all have to do with facts. But every other question has many possible answers. And we're looking for when we have a generative answer, I, I'm inviting you to not close the question. So when we have a generative interpretation of love, that doesn't mean I'm done with love. It means I can continue to be in the question of what is love and expand my capacity to love, my capacity to experience love and create it. And so that's the way we want to look at these questions. So let me try this visual thing again. Na 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 na. Okay. Everybody see that all right? Cool. So we've mentioned that we live with blind spots. In fact, probably 99.9999999% of our lives, we're in blindness. <laughs> we can see something, but we don't know everything. And so there's a healthy respect for that. If spirit is what is beyond us, it's often to what we're blind to, and it, it raises the question, how do we be open to what is beyond what I already know, what I already have experienced? And so when we're blind, we want to have new eyes. We call that being an observer. And being an observer allows us to take action. You see, if I'm a new observer in the kitchen, learning to be a chef, then I can take new actions. I can produce new results. But something we've learned in the leadership journey, and I think it's valid for the spiritual journey, it's not enough to have a new distinction, to see something new and assume I can take action. Because often the choices that are open to us are ones that we're not competent to take action with yet because our body has to learn. In fact, many people speak about spirit as a process of embodiment, not simply understanding. And so we, we refer to the actor as well. And so a generative interpretation, when used in the world of action, is to find an interpretation where it is an interpretation of action itself that we can see, do, learn, and that produces the desired outcome. So in our interpretation that action is commitment, we learn about something in language and in conversation. You produce action in conversations with other people you make requests to produce action. And if you don't make requests, you don't get any action. <laughs> and the cool thing about that is it's a generative interpretation because we can see and do a request. We can learn to make a request. And the fact that you know that now opens up to a lifetime of learning of how to make good requests or powerful offers. We're going to end today exploring how do we make a difference in the world? How do we take our vision of what's possible in the world to action? How do we make impact? And I'm gonna offer you a generative interpretation. The way that happens is you make offers. You do an act in language called an offer, an offer of a conversation, an offer of interpretation, an offer of relationship, an offer of action. If you don't, offer those possibilities, you probably don't have much going on. You probably have a lot of conversations that are not generative. See, generative conversations produce commitments. They change the future. Non-generative conversations are simply descriptions and opinions. So spirit, you ready to explore a little bit with spirit? So what is spirit for you? I'm going to ask you, some of you I see are, are writing down some, some things. I'm going to ask you to make a little section that can be your journal of your journey here. Take a moment here right now and write down, what is spirit for you? 
What is it? For some people, you may have a very ready answer from a tradition. In many spiritual traditions, it's well-defined with practices. For some of you, you may be where I was on my journey saying, I'm not sure. My answer to what is spirit is, I don't know. Moderator maybe. And what is your relationship with you? Just write that down. There's no right answer. There's no judgment here. We're just, we're just observing. Where am I with this question? And if I have an interpretation of spirit, is it generative? Does it shape my actions? Does it shape my experience? And does it shape my results in my life? Or is it simply a piece of understanding but doesn't live in my life? And so there's many thousands of traditions and interpretations of spirit, but one that I find useful for me is from Chinese wisdom traditions, including Chinese medicine, that the cosmology of that tradition is that the human being is the creature between heaven and earth. Earth is manifestation. Earth is solidity. Earth is all the messiness and the, and, and the, and the grit of physical reality and our body and our interactions and our acts. And heaven, heaven is possibility. And heaven is where spirit lives. And the human being in their story is that creature that links heaven and earth, that links possibility to bring it into manifestation. And it shows that spirit is connected through us to action and results. And so... As we look there, what can we say from all these traditions about spirit? I'll, I'll offer some, and again, the perspectives I'm, I'm offering you are provocations. You can agree, disagree. That's not an argument about who's right. This is perspectives to explore. And our intent here is to see if we can come to a more generative interpretation of spirit and engage in it to make it a more vital, alive experience in our life and a part of our choices, actions, and results. And in this tradition of Chinese wisdom, they speak about light and darkness. <clears throat> and we know that's spoken about in other traditions as well. And, and in the Western uh, Christian tradition, uh, light is good and dark is bad. But in the Chinese tradition, darkness is simply the state of potential and possibility that you have not created the eyes to see yet. And so if you want new possibilities in your life, you go to the darkness. You hang out in not knowing. You don't go to where the light already is because that's the old light. If you want a new light to show up, you have to go to the darkness. And this begins to show us our relationship in our life journey that we call the edge. That life is about learning. Life is about growing or not. And when you go to a place where you stop and say, I'm not gonna go beyond this because uh, it doesn't fit in what I already know, or I'm not gonna go beyond this because this is new for me, or I'm not gonna go beyond this because I'm uncomfortable 
We call that the edge. And our learning in our life journey, and we've certainly found it true in the leadership journey, and I believe the spiritual journey, is to go to the edge and beyond. To go where we don't know, where we don't feel comfortable, where we're in the darkness. And we look to be open, to be responsible, be receptive, not to be the small little person who's got his agenda and this is what I want to know and come and bring me this or bring me the answer that, that I like this way. Or it's like to be open to what shows up in a new way, to expand ourselves. And in this interpretation of spirit, the place of receptivity, the place of meeting spirit is referred to as your heart. And the heart is this place of connection between heaven and earth, between possibility and between manifestation and embodiment. And they have a very curious interpretation of the heart. The first time I heard it, I said, what? <laughs> In the Chinese tradition, they say the heart is a void. It's emptiness. The healthy heart is empty. Because if your heart is not empty, the spirits will not come. There's no room for spirit. Because we're full of our desires and our pains and our stories and our dramas and our no, no, no. And we need to be able to let go to openness and receptivity. Meditation is one of those paths that people do that. But I'm interested in having a healthy heart in action, not just on the mountaintop. Everybody take a deep breath and really relax on the exhale. Really feel, feel the weight of your body. I claim that a deep breath that knows how to relax and open and let go and be receptive is the first and most important skill of leadership. And I would pose for life. And in many traditions, the breath is symbolic of life. If you don't have breath, you're not alive. Breath is often the image, the metaphor of spirit itself. And so spirit is about life, not about being outside life. And we wanna bring spirit back into, into life. And when that light comes and you're open, it shines through you. In that tradition, they, they, they talk about they the word they use for one form of spirit is shen and and when your when your eyes are sparkling they call that shen birds little sparks of spirit are coming through you so that's one perspective that i find generative in the point in in the question what's your relationship with your heart where's your heart right now What is it full of? Or can you let go enough to have it be open and empty? Because then life can comes in. And I believe the mood of an empty heart receiving life is gratitude. And then spirit becomes part of our everyday life. It becomes part of our every breath. So we asked, what is your, what is spirit for you? And what is your relationship with spirit? And we're now having a conversation. And in conversation, we can create new eyes. We can see new perspectives if we're open to it. There's a poem that the 
famous British poet, William Blake, spoke about your openness to spirit or not. <laughs> and he, he, he wrote about uh, his guardian angel visiting him. And he said, so he took his wings and fled. Then the morn blushed rosy red. I dried my tears and armed my fears with 10,000 shields and spears. Soon my angel came again, but I was armed. He came in vain, for the time of youth was fled and gray hairs were on my head. And so part of the relationship with spirit that many people speak about is, are you willing to open the door when you hear the knock? Are you willing to listen? Beyond like, no, not today. Calendar's full, busy. <laughs> and yet there is the more ecstatic view of spirit as well. Here is a, a poem of the poet Hafiz, a Sufi from the 1300s. that I believe addresses our spirit. We have not come here to take prisoners. We have not come here to take prisoners, but to surrender ever more deeply to freedom and joy. We have not come into this exquisite world to hold ourselves hostage from love. Run, my dear, from anything that may not strengthen your precious budding wings. Run like hell, my dear, from anyone likely to put a sharp knife into the sacred, tender vision of your beautiful heart. We have a duty to befriend those aspects of obedience that stand outside of our house and shout to our reason, oh, please, oh, please, come out and play. For we have not come here to take prisoners or to confine our wondrous spirits, but to experience ever and ever more deeply our divine courage, freedom, and light. These are different stories. And as human beings, we live in stories. What I have found in my 40 years of working with people in leadership is we live in stories and many people view their stories as the truth, reality. And because they don't see them as stories, they don't have a choice about them as stories. And part of this exploration is to begin to see what stories do you live in? So I wanna do a short exercise with you here and we're gonna do a breakout and have you chat with a partner and then we'll come back and we're gonna take spirit into action. We live in language. What happens when we talk about spirit? Well, we're in language. What happens when we talk about action? Well, we're in language. What does language do? One thing we do is we name things. And something that was not called forth for your distinguishing is called forth by naming. But the name becomes its own thing. And we begin to have a story about the name and sometimes we don't experience what it names anymore. We have our story about love, but we don't experience love, for example. And so in this exploration of spirit, I, I was looking at it as a, a piece of language and I said, what does language do to spirit? <clears throat> it names it. There's something. We don't know what it is. And so my question for you, is spirit a noun or a verb? <laughs> are you a noun or are you a verb? 
When it's a noun, we tend to make something a thing. When it's a verb, it is something alive and moving. And another insight to how we interact in our lives comes with a claim from the biologist Umberto Maturana. He said, there are no nouns. He said, there are only verbs. What we call nouns are names of practices. So a table is not a thing, a table is a practice. A chair is not a thing, a chair is a practice. If you don't know the practice of chair, you don't know what a chair is, it's not a thing. And so with spirit, I'm gonna ask, what is spirit as a verb? What is spirit as a practice of your relationship with it? And I propose to you that a generative interpretation can be spirit is what is beyond me in my relationship with what is beyond me. And that relationship is established with the qualities of my ability to choose openness and receptivity at deeper and deeper levels. I want to make two movements more for you before we end. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, rather than take shares right now, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, continue with the conversation. And if we have time at the end, uh, we'll, we'll take some shares. Uh, and so, Hopefully at this point, you're in this place where I have a relationship with spirit and it may be, I don't know what it is and I'm searching for it or that I have an, a sense of it, an experience of it and I'm trying to understand it or I have a story about it and I don't have the experience, wherever you are, that's fine. But I wanna show how we link to the world of action. What is the world of action? There's a few of you that have studied with me in the past and you'll see something here, but we're gonna add a dimension of spirit to it. So let me, <clears throat> let me share my screen again. Whoops, that wasn't the way to do it. Okay, Maribel or Angelo, you need to give me back screen sharing. Okay. Alrighty. Um, na, 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 na. So we're back to our what question. Everybody take a deep breath. Really do it. Take a deep breath. Interesting that some of you are watching the workshop, not participating in the workshop. Just notice that. And so this question, what is action? We have a generative answer that we've been working on for 40 years. And what we found is that all your outcomes in life, both personally and in groups, organizations, teams, communities, companies, that all your outcomes are determined by the conversations you have. They're determined by the conversations you have and don't have the conversations you do well and the conversations you do poorly, the conversations you do that are generative, that produce commitment, and the conversations that are non-generative. See, the conversation winds up determining the kind of action. And that happens because conversations are where commitments are made. The core prototypical act of commitment is called a promise. When you agree to take action, are you promising? Or are you simply saying, yeah, I'll do some action. We'll see how it turns out. When I did my turnaround in my Silicon Valley days, I was working with an organization that couldn't get a product out the door for two and a half years. I was introduced to this framework I began to have generative conversations where I made requests for promises and negotiated what people could really commit to. And we delivered all 35 products on time, on budget in six months by changing the conversations. That's 
And so everything in our experience, everything in our domain of action happens in conversation. And we have conversations about spirit as well. And so what I mentioned before is the important point about seeing action is that it requires an internal state called commitment. And when you begin to be aware of that, when you begin to include that in your world, when you begin to have eyes and ears to see and hear commitment, it's a different world. And coordinating action, making things happen in the world is about producing shared commitments and learning the skills of conversation to do that. But there's another aspect here of conversation in the background of the conversation. Sometimes it's spoken about explicitly, but usually not. Is what do we care about in the conversation? What are we taking care of with the action? And when we discovered this, we found that most people don't talk about what they care about. In fact, we have a fundamental question in this journey of leadership and life. It's called, what do you care about? Our experience is that most people don't have an answer because our entire culture has told them the way you live your life is you do stuff and get out there and do stuff and do it well. And by the way, we're not going to worry about what you care about because that's just personal. It's, all, it's only about the action in the world. No, it isn't. You see, care, care is a foundation of value, satisfaction, and meaning. You can't have value without care. Do you want to produce actions and, and valuable outcomes? Then people better care about them and you better care about them. And here we are with another dimension of an internal state that's determining our results in the world. You see, if someone says, here's a really valuable action and you don't care about it, it's not valuable to you. The value comes from the care. Satisfaction comes from the care. If someone says, hey, this is a really satisfying outcome and you don't care about it, it's not satisfying. Or if someone says, this outcome must be really meaningful and you don't care about it, it's not meaningful. Care is the foundation of our life. It's the foundation of all your emotions. Why are you sad? Because something you care about has been lost. So this is a blind spot in our culture. And it's the care that determines the value, satisfaction, and meaning of our outcomes. And so I have a question for you. And if this is a new question for you, I don't expect that you to have a clear answer. What do you care about? Take, take a minute here and write down whatever is showing up. What do you care about? Now, let me give some guidance given we've been working with this question for 40 years. What you care about, I'm not asking for what you desire. Nor am I asking what you love. Oh, I care about my family. Yeah, you love your family. But the kind of care I'm talking about is the kind of care that says, this made my life meaningful. This was what my life was about. This was worthwhile. What is that care? And we, we find that people take six months to two years if they stay in the question before they sometimes find that. So don't, don't be alarmed if it's not clear for you. The gift here is not the answer. The gift here is the question that this question is important. Can the host please mute? Who's ever, <laughs> who's ever microphone we're hearing? So write down, what do you care about? And what's your reaction to the question? And even if you don't have an answer, I congratulate you because now your world, your world of action is generated in its value, satisfaction, and meaning from your internal state of what you care about, then it's pretty important for you to know what that is.
Okay, everybody take a deep breath. The practice of the breath is, is to relax, let tension leave you and let go and get out of your head, be present. It's an act of becoming present. So how are you doing with your care question? You may have some clarity or you may have just more questions, but it's, it's perhaps one of the most worthy questions in your life. Now, where I showed you that these internal states of care and commitment, let me describe how I see spirit. What's underneath your care? What's underneath your deepest care, your deepest source of meaning in your life? Is the spirit inside of you. I'm going to refer to the, the spirit in you and the spirit around you. The big spirit is the spirit of reality. But there's also a spirit in you. And a spiritual life has to do with the relationship between those two spirits. Becoming aware of them, becoming connected to them, experiencing them, learning how to make choices in them. And by the way, I want to caution us that sometimes when we talk about connecting with spirit, that it's only moving to the light. It's only moving to the good stuff. You know, we get the calmness and stillness that Pasha talked about. But if we're going to live in our embodied world, we have to be big enough to embrace all of life, the light and the dark, the stillness and the chaos. And interestingly enough, when you learn how to be with anything in that way, that part of you that can be with anything is still. It's the stillness and the chaos. It's awareness itself. And so if we connect through this question of what do I care about? What is the deepest? And we begin to listen beyond our answers, beyond our history. What we find is each of us has a unique story, a unique calling, a unique resonance with life. In the Chinese tradition, it's referred to as your destiny. What is your destiny? Your destiny is to become you. And when we have suffering and issues with health in your life is because you're working very hard not to be you. That everything has a fundamental way of being that you were born with. If, if we use the, the, the image, you know, some of you were born to be eagles. Some of you were born to be oak trees. And when the oak tree tries to be an eagle, it doesn't work out too well. Or the eagle tries to be an oak tree. So how do you know who you are, what you are? Life tells you. What makes you alive? What draws you to grow? What is the light that calls you? Not like a good story in your head, but like a sense of your aliveness inside you. This is where you listen to the experience, not the story about the experience. And so when we saw that care informed all the whole action conversation, that when you connect to your care, and then you know what to take care of. What to take care of is what I will commit to. I will commit to take care of this, and that will produce value, satisfaction, and meaning for me, because that is a sign of alignment with myself and life. And when we begin to expand our embrace, when we begin 
to see bigger possibilities that we want to contribute to the world, we have one more dimension I'm going to share with you. And that is that in our conversations and in our awareness, we live in a relationship with our world. What is the world? The world is not what's out there. The world is what you are configured to see, what, you, what your stories, your world. Everybody has a different world. What world have you, have you constructed in your life? What world were you given by your history? And a lot of the action conversations are about do produce results in the world, produce results in the world. We got the numbers, we got the measures, we got la, 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 la. But the only way that happens is a side effect of collaborative action. You're not successful in business unless you got customers. And so you go to the we space of the connection of people together is what produces action that we recognize as results in the world. But this is where leadership shows up that we found that in order to be competent in the we space of coordination to produce something in the world, you have to get to know yourself at a deep level. You have to get to know these dimensions of care and commitment and conversation and coordination. And so in our work in leadership, we ask people what they're looking for and it's often something in the world and we take them back down to the me space. Once you begin to have competence in choice in your me space, I know what I care about. Perhaps I even have my relationship with spirit and I can bring that to others. Then we can coordinate action to produce something in the world. And so spirit in action Have your conversation with spirit. Have your experience with spirit. What is it saying to you? What is it calling you to? And you have to choose. You have to choose. What is that care that I'm going to commit to take care of in the world? And that takes you to the we space. And what is the we space? It's the space of connection and interaction with others. It is a space of conversation. In fact, it's a space of discourse. Discourse is not only the set of conversations, it's the background of the very vocabulary and set of distinctions that you use that becomes your context. When you see these connections, you can begin to see a journey into the depths of myself, to get to know myself, to find who I am, to find what resonates for me in my aliveness, to bring that out to say, what is meaningful for me in my work in the world, to learn the territory of action, which is a territory of conversation and commitment and coordination, and begin to invite people to new commitments, to new conversations, to new perspectives that produce shared action and makes an impact in the world. That's the essence of building a team. That's the essence of an organization. It's the essence of a company, a community, a family, or a movement. That's what I've discovered in our 40 years of exploring action and the depths of meaning. And I offer this to you as a provocation for your exploration. And I hope it produces some sense of value that this stuff is not disconnected. Does it mean this journey is easy? No. There's no magic wand. In the Chinese wisdom tradition, with a human being, you are, are the connector of heaven and earth. We go up, we do the gesture of up 
that's called inspiration. We, we bring forth inspiration from possibility, but it has to come down. It has to come down into bodies. And it gets messy there because the bodies have to learn and mistakes happen and breakdowns happen. And it requires discipline. It requires learning and practice. And then it produces embodiment, both in the individual and the group. That is the spiritual journey of spirit into action. And it gets messy and it's not always happy, but we learn to have a big enough embrace to embrace all of it in life. So those are the three movements I wanted to share with you. And uh, uh, Angela, I'm happy to stay a little longer if people want to chat, if, if, if you're available, but. I'm available, sure. Yeah, and so with that, let's all take a deep breath. Come present and open, openness and receptivity. What's, what's happening for you? And let's give a high 10 to our colleagues here that we've had this journey with. And I'm, Angela, I'm gonna give you a, a chance to do the closing on time. And then anybody who wants to stay, I'm happy to chat a little more with you of what's been provoked in this conversation. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, one is that Bob's Institute offers, if you don't want to sign up for the first free, they have lots of lots of offerings, a lot of free offerings um, about some of the substance that Bob began to share with us today around, for example, semantic stuff and work with, work with your body. And um, anyway, um, I just want to thank Bob for, for coming. We're going to stay a little bit more. If some people have to go, I'm just going to call. It's, t it's now 1230. So are official, we're officially closed, but we're still open for business for a little bit. <laughs> okay, awesome. So uh, I invite any of you to, to have, a, have a question or a share uh, of the journey. And, and again, everybody's journey is, uh, is unique, but there are some of these, what I see in the explorations I've been involved in for 40 years is there is something common to being human in life and that if we can pull those out, we can have choices in our, in our unique uh, personal journey. So let's have some shares. What, what happened for you? <laughs> Besides being stunned. <laughs> Anybody have a question or a share? Oh, well, I can start with um, in the chat. I saw that um, mayor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Asked the question that said, um, is it right to say that chaos brings me to life? And uh, I thought that was an interesting perspective. If maybe yeah. you could speak on that. Well, given everything's a perspective, we won't use the terminology of right and wrong. It's a perspective. But I remember one of my master teachers, another master teacher of mine is Dr. Richard Heckler. And we were speaking about aliveness. And he said, uh, he was on a volunteer fire department. He said, yeah, we went to this, uh, I was called out last night for this volunteer fire department going to this house that needed some help. And there was somebody vomiting in the, in, in the corner. And I said, there's some aliveness. Why do we always define aliveness only as the happy state? It's pretty intense aliveness to be in, in chaos. But the key about that is what's the quality of the of the aliveness. You see, one of the things we've learned uh, and, and that traditions have supported is that we are creatures of choice. We are always in choice. So the fact you're in chaos is not good or bad. It gives you a choice. What do you do when you're in chaos? <laughs> what does the oak tree do in chaos? What does the eagle do in chaos? And we have a, a fundamental embodied skill called centering, which is learning how to be in relationship with your, your body, your emotions and your stories in a way that you can find choice no matter what's going on outside of you. And so the journey of being alive in chaos is, how am I gonna be, what's my choice here? What am I gonna choose? And how do I build my muscles? through practice, 
to be the, the way I want to be when I'm encountering chaos. And from the point of view of context, can I be big enough to be bigger than the chaos? See, chaos is also a story like it's chaos. It's bigger than me. I'm, I'm lost in the chaos rather than no, I am the space in which the chaos is showing up. What does that give me? I can bring possibilities. What possibilities do I want to bring? How do I learn to do that? How do I make it manifest through my embodiment? That's the path of learning. That's the path of practice. And, and by the way, that's a pretty important skill for leaders. Walk into a meeting of this chaos. What the hell are you going to do? <laughs> how, do you, how do you bring a center to that? How do you? So good, good, good comment. Good question. Who else? What's been provoked for you? Love to hear. Bob, I have a question. Sure. Um, your, your, your comment that many people are over in the space of world cares rather than me cares resonated for me. So how do you guide or, or help somebody get to the me care if they're sort of stuck in the world care without knowing the me care yet. Yeah, good. This is, this is, you know, when we talked about offers in the world, this is what the offer of the Institute is all about. That's the work we, we do there. First of all, <clears throat> we've learned over the years that one of the principles that really is powerful for us as human beings is that awareness creates choice. So there are some cultural blind spots. So that me, we world came out of uh, discovering that in organizations, people were so trapped in the numbers and the external action is that they were blind and, and they didn't have a, a very healthy uh, uh, repertoire of how to, how to be together and cranking those numbers. And that's when people begin to feel exhausted. They feel like they're part of a machine. There's no meaning. Uh, and, and that's because you're stuck in the world only. And so through our learning with uh, action and coordination, we said, ah, results are always a coordination. Even if you're doing it alone, you're doing it for somebody. <laughs> So there's always the we. And when you go to these places that are just in the mechanical metaphor, the, by the way, I think the fact that people think mechanically about action is probably our biggest issue in the world right now. We've left out people. And then we've left out commitment. And then we've left out care. And then we've, right? So we go to the we space and say, all those results, all those measures are coming from people coordinating action. So we got to be good at that. And large companies uh, miss that because they think they put in processes that are fairly reliable and then the people get ignored and everybody's just a cog in the machine. But when we come to that we space, we come to the space of team where people know in, in organizations they're part of teams. Um, it's, another, uh, it's another dimension of blindness. How do you make a team? Uh, from our point of view, the, the illumination we bring, teams are generated in conversations. Are you having the right conversations? Do you even know what they are? And those conversations are not concepts to do procedures. The conversation is a full body contact sport. When you have a conversation, do you connect to people? Do you listen in a way that they feel listened to? Do you manage the mood to be opening rather than closing? And so it becomes a performance art, not a, a mechanical. And so, you know, we're, we're out there trying to get the word out and people live uh, in their resignation and their complacency. The resignation is, well, this is the world I've always seen. Uh, this is the way it's always going to be. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm not going to listen to anybody who says there could be something different. And so the people who tend to come up and, and, and arrive and say, hey, I'm ready to learn are people who say, oh, really? There's a new point of view? Like I could, I could learn in me how to be the person who's creating 
that healthy dynamic out there? Yeah, I'd like to learn that. Does that, that answer your question, Charles? Anything else? I just want to follow up on Charles's yeah, question. Thanks. I'm sorry, Charles. Yeah. Um, so what I thought I heard Charles say is that, okay, so people are in this, in this um, world space. Yeah. And um, so before they can really do that effectively, let's say, um, they need to um, not only be in the we space, but also in the me space. Yeah. So obviously you have a, a curriculum for that, but in short, um, how do you get people to um, in touch with what they care about? Uh, when, when we talk to people, we say, what do you want? What do you want from your learning? What's going on? Where's the pain for you? Is dealing with that pain in giving you what you want, which is almost always includes some results out there in the we space and some shift in the me space. They've, they're already bringing it. And we say, yeah, there, there, is, there is a discipline, there is a perspective that you could learn and create that in, in your life. Are, are you interested? But it's not trivial. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's a professional development uh, that people have to take through this embodiment uh, practice. And so I think, I think the biggest thing is we're not yet a big enough voice to wake people up to, do you notice the world you're living in is full of resignation? <laughs> Do you notice the lack of satisfaction? Do you notice the, the dissatisfaction? Do you notice the, the negative moods, the lack of meaning? It's like organizations don't have to be that way. But we have to go all the way down to the human being so that we can create an environment for human beings that then generate action from passion and commitment rather than being constrained by the mechanical demand. Is that better? What's missing? I say Hello, may I say something? Sure. Oh, uh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kain. Kain. Uh, um, so, what I was gathered from that question: How do you get from the world back to me? Um, I think like a very basic, simple answer is like spend time with yourself in solitude, in silence, in nature. Mm -hmm. Start to question your inner state. Like, what are you feeling in solitude? What are you feeling around certain people? When you go do things, what are you, what are you feeling from that? Like, does it bring up anxiety? Where do those anxiety come from? Um, and just start to be more open to the world around you moment by moment, like, you know, even if you're just like seeing someone and they're, you're, they're holding the door for you and they make eye contact with you, what does that feel like? Do they feel opening? Should you say something like stuff like that? You know what I'm saying? You can have really meaningful interactions with like basic in basic situations, you know, take the role out of things. When you go to CVS, like don't look at them as a cashier be like, how are you? Like you're another human being, like stuff like that. I think can just help to kind of make this shift from like caring about, things because the world has taught you to care about them. And then just like going down to the basic humanist, humanist like role of it all. And then figuring out like, okay, I have strength in these places with people doing with people. I don't have these strengths. This makes me feel good. Let me keep doing this. This doesn't make me feel good. Let me cut this out. You know what I mean? So that's what comes to mind for me. Okay. Um, good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. I was answering the question, why go to the me? And if you're talking about how to go to the me, the question that we have pursued over the decades is what is important to go to the me? The question I gave you, what do you care about, takes you to the me. The question, what are you committed to, takes you to the, to the me. The question, how do you coordinate action? What happens in your body when you, when you are asked to do something and the only proper answer is no, are you afraid to say no? That's me. And that's beginning to live in the, in the action space and learning what is it that has to be paid attention to, to learn to be a, an effective actor and where do I need to build new muscles? And Kayin's uh, 
answer was a, a, a good one for, for being present and making choices in it. What, what we've done with the, uh, uh, the discipline we've had, I didn't, didn't take you to a lot of places we could have gone, but <clears throat> what has to happen in a conversation includes awareness, choice and skill with the somatics of the situation. That includes connection, presence, openness, trust, safety. You know how to do that? And what do you do when you're in a situation where you don't feel that? What do you do about it? The leader skill is to be able to take a breakdown situation and move it into this positive direction. It takes emotional skills. Are you uh, facing or bringing resignation, anger, distrust, uh, overwhelm, anxiety? Those are called closing moods. Closing moods close your possibilities. And we're always in a mood. And the first place we need to learn about moods is in ourselves. And our culture tends to be blind to them. And we tend to think of our mood as, well, that's the way the world is. <laughs> I'm not resigned. It's just obvious here. You can't do that. <laughs> and we wake people up to say, no, 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 no. That's coming from your story, not from the situation. How do we become generative? And then language. You know how to make a clear request? A lot of people don't. Do you know how to make a decline or a counteroffer? A lot of people don't. They haven't been taught that. And how does that all come together? And how do we begin to find our edges on that journey and practice so that we're building a bigger, more healthy space of choice for ourselves and then with others? How are we doing? Is this Yeah. What else we got? What else has been provoked? Pasha. Uh, yeah, Bob. Um, could you kindly just go over how you articulated and defined the edge in your work? Yeah, the, the edge is what we call the place where you go from knowing to not knowing from being comfortable to being uncomfortable, from being confident to uncertain, where you go from what you know to what you don't know. And everybody has a relationship with the edge. Some people's relationship with the edge is to avoid it. Oh, is it gonna edge here? I'm gonna go back to the comfort zone. I'm gonna go back to what I know. And they don't learn, they don't grow. They get stuck and they suffer. And so what we do is when, and, and, they're, and what commonly shows up at the edge is fear. And so part of what the learning journey is, is to build a, a relationship with fear that's an opening relationship, not a closing one. When, when, we, when our relationship with fear is, fear showed up, so I'm going to contract and be afraid. We've lost our power. When we have a relationship with fear that says, oh, I'm having a fear reaction. What am I going to do about that? We're empowered. Now, one of my teachers said it well. He said, fear is simply your body telling you you're not organized for the moment yet. Mm. And yet the body feels like we're going to die. <laughs> and so we build this new relationship to be able to move from your commitment rather than uh, having fear be the gatekeeper. We can move into fear, beyond fear. Um, and so we help people see their relationship with the edge and create the edge as the door to possibility, to go beyond the edge rather than being fearful or uncomfortable is an exploration into the unknown. And we don't need to know. We build a new relationship with the unknown and we go with curiosity, perhaps even fascination, to explore new possibilities. 
and to face the risks of the journey and, and hopefully prudent enough so we don't get eaten by a tiger. And so the edge is always there in, in uh, the hope that a lot of our early students have, oh, you're going to help me get past my edge, then I'll be okay. <laughs> and we say, no, 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 you've only moved the edge. You'll always have an edge. Yeah. It's your relationship with the unknown. And maybe for some of us, what's on the other side of that edge is spirit. So I have a piece of Thank art you. upstairs and it says, um, one must have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. Oh my God, that's a beautiful image. Wow, Thank you. that's I'd a whole different. I'd yeah. be interested in hearing more about or a little bit more about what you referenced in regards to health and health issues and um, the connection to not allowing your true self to emerge. Could you okay. speak a little more about that? Yeah. In, in the Chinese medicine world that I've become fascinated with, they have a lot of spirit. And the spirits are actually manifested in the qualities of your, your embodied energies. So spirit's not this abstract thing off on the mountain. It's, it's in you and, and it's healthy or it's not. And the idea is that if, you're, if you have some idea of who you should be, but you don't know how to listen to who you are, then you work very hard to be something that maybe is not part of your makeup, not part of your structure. And it's exhausting usually doesn't work very well. One of the uh, phrases from that tradition is, is we, have a, uh, we have will, part of our makeup is will. Our will. When our will is aligned with who we are, when we've learned who we are and, and, and what makes us alive, and it becomes easy, we flow and we produce fruit. When our will, is trying to go against uh, who we are, it will kill you. And our, our culture isn't aware of that. And our culture is very much about performance, uh, learn this, do that, be that. But we're missing the conversation of, well, who are you? What is your healthy path? And that alone, I think, uh, opens up a whole new set of choices when people begin to see, oh, I don't have to be this punching bag. I don't have to be this ATM. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be the one who knows. And then who am I? Well, what makes you alive? That's probably the path of health. But aliveness here is not excitement. When, uh, there's some refinement here. It's not just about getting high and being being excited it's it's more about landing place where you say I'm fully here and alive and and uh, satisfied how's you, that uh, powerful i've already i'm going to be connecting with you outside of here oh, okay. um, when you said you asked the question what do you care about you said not family like even family okay go beyond that how come because for me, actually, family is very, very important to me. Yeah, that's um, because, and that was one of the first things that did come up for me. Yeah, very good. It's because people stop at family, and there there are other domains in life besides family. So of course we want to have a healthy relationship with them, and we love our family, and there's care there, absolutely. But most people are challenged with, well, what about everything else? What about the work I do every day? What do I care about yeah. this? You go with the R. Yeah. And, and so uh, uh, family is granted. Of, and there are some people who, who make their life around taking care of family only. But for most people, it, there's more than that. So I don't want you to just get stopped. Yes, you care about family, but don't stop there. Uh, one of the exercises we do is what I call the deathbed exercise. 
and I have you reflect as though you're at the end of your life. You know that you're at the end of your life. You don't have any more possibilities to go. And you reflect back on what did you do with your life? Were you satisfied? Because you'll be satisfied if you took care of what you cared about. And if the story is, well, I worked hard and I made a lot of money and I, I did what other people wanted and it basically sucked. We didn't, we didn't find what we cared about really and aligned ourselves with that. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. How about one more? Anybody got something? Else? Um, yeah. Yeah. I have a question about um, care and like connecting to care. And you may have answered this to an extent. If so, I apologize. But I feel like um, for me, particularly, there's like a, a disconnection for me and my care. And I think yeah. that comes from like family traumas and shame and grief. And you have yeah. anything to say about like connecting to your care or any exercises or like how to, what would you, how would okay. you answer that? If someone comes in with that. Yeah. Ian. A lot of us, again, I, and I mentioned, I mentioned most people in our culture, when we ask them what they care about, they, they really don't know. It's perplexing because it's a question that has not been part of our education. We haven't honored the question. And I think it's the most important question in our, in our active life. Uh, when we're disconnected from our care, we can discover it. So the first thing is, take a deep breath in. Give yourself permission that you care, even if you don't know what it is, and it matters. Because there's a lot of stories that can get in the way that, well, that's selfish and you should do something else. It's like, no, you need to have permission that I get to have a care. I get to have meaning. And when I have that, then I can begin to explore. This exploration, as I said before, can take months or even years, but it's a worthy exploration. The most active way to do that is to, to face specific situations, ones that you've lived in your past or ones that you imagine. What if I was uh, uh, going to become a horse trainer and, and run a horse ranch? That's, that's a question. And what you do is you don't listen to your head, you listen to your heart. Does your heart brighten up at that? Or it's like, nope, that ain't it. And so we begin to let life teach us what is meaningful for us. Where, where do I respond? And that's where you're going to find care. And we have to get past all that family dynamic and, and, and stuff that shows up that can get in the way. I tell the story when I first started to really understand the power of care in how it was active in my life. And, and, I, and I was had begun my teaching and, and coaching career. And, and I said, What's, how, how can I tell the story about care so people can get it? And I tell the story about changing my daughter's diaper. And uh, it was way back in the late 80s. I had my first child with my, my wife at the time. And uh, I'd grown up in a traditional family where my mom was a homemaker and my dad went out to work. And so it was very traditional. And my wife had done all the caretaking of the baby. I thought that made sense to me. And uh, after about six months, my wife turned to me and said, Bob, now you, you change the diaper. It's your turn and with, a, with an edge on. I said, oh, shit. What? Okay, it's, it's, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. And I will do my part. And I fully expected I was going to have an unpleasant experience of cleaning up shit. Okay, that's, let's go. So I, I'm there with my daughter and she had uh, diapers on and I unhooked the diapers and opened the diaper and sure enough, had a full experience of shit. 
And then I looked up and, and looked in my daughter's eyes and she looked at me and she smiled. And she gave me a little wiggle. And at that moment, it changed what changing a diaper was about. Now I knew what I was taking care of. It wasn't about the shit. Don't let the shit get in the way. Look for what it is you're taking care of that matters to you. That helpful? Yeah, definitely. All right. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do one more, Ron, here. And then uh, the last thing I'll say, Ian, is, is, is do the practice, have fun at it. Don't make it a burden because your life's at stake. Mm. This is not some intellectual game. This is your life at stake. Mr. Ron, an old friend of mine. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, the question I'm going to ask you is how close is this connection between what you care about and what cares about you. As you know, you mentioned my favorite word, calling. And are they always, is that, is that the heart of that dynamic or is there occasionally you access that in order to, to understand what you care about? Or are they absolutely like yin and yang, uh, just absolutely bound together? I think, I think they're bound together, Ron. I, see, when you, care, when you care about something, one of the things I've learned uh, with almost anything, when people aren't into their desires, if you care about something, other people do too. Which means if you're an offer to take care of that care, you will find a market. You will take value to the world. There is already the calling there. And sometimes when that's not clear, we need to go deep inside to listen to that relationship with spirit, to the context of life itself, to the the, the structure of uh, of life, you know, and 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 you you mentioned uh, who or what cares about you, and in in Chinese medicine, the context of life is an energy, and they call that energy love. Yeah. And so uh, these these are places that we. Uh, when, when, you find, when you find this, you, you have the experience of resonance. So we're not only looking for the aliveness, we're then looking for resonance with others. And that's the journey. Um, that we not only find it, we can create it. Um, thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming today and, and, and engaging in this exploration and taking this extra time uh, to explore. And I hope as I said at the beginning, that uh, it's been a provocation for you. The, there's no right answer. I hope you take these questions and experiences forward in your life. Uh, all I'm trying to do is share from my journey that I believe spirit is not something outside of life. It's in every moment of life. Uh, when you see a dog wagging his tail or someone with sparkling eyes, you're in the presence of spirit. And uh, if, if we hold it that way, we have an, another dimension to bring to our aliveness and to our contribution in the world. So I'll, I'll ask for one other short exercise. Everybody take a deep breath. And I'm gonna ask you to enter the mood of gratitude. That is for me, the most powerful mood of all because you did not earn that breath. It is given to you as a gift. Life is a gift. Every breath is a gift. No matter what's going on, no matter how shitty it is out there, you have breath. Come back to gratitude and you will find your way wherever you are. And so for me, I'm grateful to have shared this time with you. Thank you very much. Angelo, my friend. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for um, your generosity and giving us your wisdom and different perspective of looking at things. And uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you so much.